Hi, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj. And on this podcast, we're going to talk about some deep stuff. I'm here to tell you that you're amazing. And often, the only person who can't see that is you. No matter who you are, what you do, or where you're from, there's greatness in you. Let's talk about it. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj, life, business, and relationship coach, and welcome to the Transformation Starts Today podcast, where I interview leaders, champions, and high performers from all walks of life as they share their story, the lessons they've learned along the way, and empowering perspectives to help you create an extraordinary life without regret starting today. Today we have with us a truly inspiring man, a wonderful husband and father, and a good friend of mine, Shellen Hutchinson. Shellen Hutch, the Marine Investor Hutchinson, is a Master Gunnery Sergeant E9 in the United States Marine Corps. Throughout his 23-year career, he has served in many leadership roles in Marine Corps aviation. Hutch has successfully executed over 2.4 million in single family real estate transactions, which include over $870,000 as a real estate agent, currently not active, and co-sponsored over $26 million in multifamily property acquisition, totaling over 350 units in the Southeast. Hutch has earned a Bachelor of Science in Aeronautics from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. He is the husband of Athena for 20 years and the father of three beautiful children. Hutch, it is an honor to have you with us, brother. Welcome to the show. Oh, man. Appreciate you having me, brother. Thank you. How are you? Man, I'm feeling blessed and highly flavored, man. <laughs> I love that. Highly flavored. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, we all have a little bit of spice in us. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, when God, when God created us, created us, the universe or wherever we came from, you know, from the spiritual realm to this physical realm, it's like, that's a little bit of spice. I'm going to call you Hutch. There you go. <laughs> I love that. And I want to, first, I want to thank you because I know that um, right now, I believe you're still in Japan. Is that correct? Still in Japan. It's yeah, five Japan. 520 in the morning. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So thank yeah. you for the commitment to, to being here for, for this conversation, for the audience listening. You know, this Absolutely. is the second, second podcast I've recorded today that somebody's 12, 15 hour time zone difference. And it's a, it's a, it's a commitment. So thank you for being here. We appreciate you. I yeah, appreciate you having me, brother. Yeah, man. So let's dive in. Yeah. And so for my listeners who don't know you yet, they're not sure about, you know, your story. I found that each of us, we are the hero of our own story. We've experienced, experienced challenges, setbacks, and adversities that we've overcome to get to where we are now. And so if you can please share with us, what is your hero story and some of the lessons you've learned along the way? Oh, man, Doc. <laughs> so you and I, you, well, you, myself, and Dr. Jones, we did a podcast interview not too long ago for our podcast, The Multifamily Real Estate Experiment. Yes. And I remember I asked you this question, like, you know, in, in order for um for us to really grow, we gotta know who we are. And then you went in, went into an explanation of who we are. And by by that time, I'm like, oh shit, I need to I need to learn myself. <laughs> and oh man, because you take it, you take it down to a spiritual level. And uh, that was fascinated for me. You know what I mean? So I, I guess I could say that uh, I am a sp- I'm an ever evolve- evolving spiritual being who understand that who I was, it was based on my life experience and the decisions that I made and who I become is who I choose to be. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you know, but <laughs> outside of all that, just to help people understand this physical realm, you know, um, I'm Hutch the Marine Investor, born, um, born and raised in Jamaica. Um, and, you know, I, I, I grew up in an environment where it really takes a village to raise a child, right? I grew up on what used to be a slave plantation, you know? So um, rich in culture, um, wealthy environment, we actually have a river running through the plantation and that, you know, that, that provide us with some natural resources, right? Tall fruit trees, you know, plethora of vegetable and just very fertile land and a community of just a whole bunch of cousins, aunties and uncles, you know what I mean? That everyone gives into everybody. So you better not act up, you get your butt whooped by anybody in the community, right? So, you know, discipline was the order of the day, right? But also, we grew up in a very, very um, a good environment with, with family. You know, so migrated to America in um, 1998, 
right? My dad, he would travel on what we call farm work, which they, it's a, a system where America imports imports um, workers to work in different forms, whether it's picking tomatoes, picking tobaccos, whatever the case may be, right? Um, so my dad did that for a couple of years. And then he finally got his naturalization card and he was able to, to do all the paperwork for myself and my brothers to come up. So for me, that coming up was 1998. You know, mm-hmm. shortly after that, I joined the Marine Corps, man. And it was not until like 20, I want to say 2020, around September of 2020, that I really asked my, myself a question, like, how did I get here? You know, and you know, that takes me back into a life journey of really understanding our little decision and lit, our little seeds that was planted in my, throughout my life, you know, brought me to America, brought me to Marine Corps, and also at the time that it did. And that's something we can, we can dissect as we go on in this conversation, because it's really good to pay attention, you know, to, you, to your journey. You know, so I joined the Marine Corps in 1998, shortly after coming to, the, coming to America, got stationed out in Hawaii for 10 years and three months, you know, rough life, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not complaining whatsoever. Met my beautiful wife, Athena, out there. Her dad was, was a Marine veteran as well, you know, um, and, you know, three beautiful children. And right now we're just on the path of, you know, creating legacy for those children that we choose to bring into the world while we enrich our relationship as husband and wife, you know, so Yes, looking forward to this conversation, my brother. Awesome, man. I love that. Thank you for sharing the, your background. And given, you know, so you grew up in Jamaica for the first, um, how old were you when you moved in 1998? Oh, 18. 18. So the first 18 years of your life, you were in Jamaica and on that plantation. That's where you grew up, right? Well, well, yes. So just for the record, slavery has been abolished for a long, long time. No, Jamaica, yes, right? for sure. So what used to be a slave plant, coffee slave plantation. Yeah, so... I, um, for the first 13 years, I lived in on the mountainside, which is a place called Juan de Bolas, right? This is where at any day you can see somebody walking around bare feet or with water boots with, with the machete underneath their arm, you know, just walking up the hill, you know, going to meet their friends, or, you know what I mean? So, you know, for me, um, in Jamaica, you got to take um, um, entrance exam to go to high school, you know, so when I finally passed my, my entrance exam, I believe I was 13 or 14, Right. I used to have to walk um, 3.3 miles from where, where I was up and down hill in the wee hours in the morning to go catch a school bus, you know, to drive you know, tons of miles to go to my high school. You know, I mean, then I would have to walk the same distance, you know, um, from the bus stop to get home in the dark. Right. Sometimes was by myself, but uh, most time I had a lot of cousins around, you know, to walk with and talk about life, you know, life as we knew it. Right. Um, yeah, but it was fun. Given that experience, and this is what I was alluding to, I think that one of the most powerful, I'm going to use the word resources that I think we have is the resource of perspective. Given right. that experience that you had, and then for many people in the US, the experience is very different. And so how did that experience grow you in hindsight as you look back? Yeah, so one of the, you just looking back, brother, I'm telling you, you know, when you grew up in a certain environment, you have certain certain wishes, like, you know, sometimes you think about, I wish things could have been better, whatever the case may be, you know, but looking back, and, uh, you know, hindsight is 2020, right, so just looking back and see that I had a community around me, right, but one, one of the beautiful thing I like about the community that around me, it's, I look at it both ways, right? We had a community where um, not a lot of folks understood a big, or had a bigger thinking, like how do I create a better situation for my, I mean, better life situation, right? So there was not a lot of folks striving for what I now call success, right? Or my preview of success, right? You know, in that community, success would be, you know, um, inheriting some land, you know, from that was passed down for generation and being able to plant some crops in it and have those crops grow beautifully and then be able to reap those crops, take them to the market uh, every Saturday and, and live, live a good life that way. You, you, know, you know what I mean? Um, so no one was really teaching me um, to think outside of that environment. But what, what, what was also beautiful 
is that no one was telling me that, you know, um, things were not possible, right? So that was a good thing that I had because what, what I've seen is that when some folks grew up into small community, their paradigm is, is restricted by the way of thinking, like, don't think about that. You will never be that. I never had that growing up. And I thought it was beautiful for me. So I constantly evolved. So when I moved to Kingston, right, uh, when I was 13, moving with my, with my mom, you know, things just started to open up, you know, because, so because I wasn't restricted, I got to think a lot bigger, you know, so the sky was the limit for me. So when I came to America, you know, it was a natural growth for me because there's no one, restri- no one restricting my mental, um, my mental capacity or, or the way I thought. Mm, I love that. And I think there's also something for everyone listening. It's almost the best of both worlds. If you can right. blend, like you said, in the way most people think of success, I think the trap is we strive for more because we think more is better. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Dr. Wayne Dyer is a beautiful quote where he says, where is the peace and more is better. And if we're always striving, thinking I need a certain amount of money or from a real estate perspective, a certain amount of doors or something like that properties. The problem is that that certain amount never ends up being enough. And so you, you hit it at some point. And then when you hit it, it's like, okay, well, I got it. What now? And then you set a bigger goal and that kind of never stops. And so in terms of the fulfillment and the life satisfaction, it's almost not there. It's like the never ending hamster wheel kind of thing versus in more of a simpler lifestyle, it turns into, like you said, you can be very fulfilled. Anyone who's listening is just coming to me right now. There's that story. I'm going to, you know, paraphrase it because it's a longer story, but it's like the story of the American businessman. He goes to some Island and essentially he sees this fisherman and the guy's fishing and he brings in some fish. And then the businessman says, Hey, you should, like, come work with me. We'll turn it into a whole business. And I'm, you know, kind of p- making the story shorter. We're going to turn it right. into a whole business. You'll make all this money. It'll be great. And prior to that, he says to the fisherman, what are you doing with all that fish? And he goes, oh, I'm going to take the fish. I'm going to, you know, cook them. I'm going to give them to some people. I'm going to support my family. And we're going to lay on the beach and we're going to watch the stars and enjoy the night. And so after the business guy's like, what are you going to do with all that fish? And he, and he says that and he goes, no, no, don't do that you should like create a <laughs> business and do all this stuff. And then we can scale it and we can get you a fishing boat and we'll do all this stuff. And this goes on and on for a few minutes. And eventually the guy goes, and what would be the purpose of that? And what would be the purpose of that? And eventually the businessman goes, because then maybe five, 10, 20 years from now, when you really scale it up, you'll be able to just relax on the beach and be with <laughs> your family and look up at the stars and enjoy yourself. And the guy goes, but I'm doing that right now. Yeah. <laughs> right? And the businessman's got this perspective that he can't do that yet. He or she can't do that yet because they have to like make it first. They have to do all this stuff. But very often people who live simpler lives, they show us you don't have to wait. Like you can enjoy yourself in that way now. And so like you, it seems like what you had when you get that best of both worlds where you have that fulfillment and satisfaction and life is just good coupled with like the family support and the encouragement and no one's saying you can't do that. And then you put that together and it creates a really beautiful life perspective. It seems like. Absolutely. I'm telling you one, 100%, right? So some folks talk about the delayed gratif- gratification. And one of the things that I've learned from you, Dr. Jamil, is that we all aspire for this level of happiness, right? And what happened is that society tells us that we need to, we need to um, abide by these hustle and bustle, right? And then be happy when, yeah, right? But one of the great things that one of the powerful and what you would say useful, right, information that I've, that I've learned from you is that, you know, you can enjoy that feeling now. And it's really important to understand the feeling that you're aspiring to create and once you are able to identify that feeling, then you can actually enjoy life through whatever goals and aspiration you set for you for yourself. So whether it's a, the physical attainment of of a goal, right, right, you can you can enjoy the feeling while you strive to to attain that physical goal. You know, yeah, so and, it, yeah. it's beautiful, man. <laughs> I'm so glad that yeah. I made it with you. And just so I can give some background on it for everyone who's not as yeah. familiar. Think of it like this, whatever you want, doesn't matter what it is, you don't actually want that. You want the feeling that you believe you'll have as a result of having that thing. So if you say right now, 
I want $5 million. If I just gave you $5 million, pieces of paper in your closet and said you couldn't spend it, are you happy? It's like, <laughs> well, no, because you didn't want the money. You want what you thought the money would give you. Like the experiences, right. the sense of security, all that. But the reality is that feelings such as that sense of security don't come from anything outside of you. They come from you. So why is it that you feel really good when you accomplish a goal? It's not because of the thing that you just got. It's because you made that feeling conditional. Once I get that, once I get X, I'll feel Y. Now that you right. got it, you give yourself permission to feel it. That's the only difference. But whatever you want to feel, you can start feeling it now. So if you say, once I do that, then I'll feel confident with myself. You could do that. You're free to do that. That's the way you want to set it up. Fine. But that isn't necessary because confidence doesn't come from that thing. It comes from you. And so when you recognize nice. emotions are an inside out job, <laughs> it changes everything. Because I, I often tell people when it comes to happiness, think of it like a distinction. You can either do something in order to get happy or you can do something happily. If you're doing <laughs> it in order to get happy, you're going to be doing it forever and you're not going to be happy. Now, you might eventually, and the reason is because you're always coming from the space of I'm not there yet, I'm not there yet, I'm not there yet. So there's, there's like that inherent like feeling of lack and like lack of, you know, I'm not, I'm not sufficient, all that kind of stuff. I'm deficient in all these ways because I'm not there yet. And then when you finally arrive, there's a momentary joy, perhaps. But the thing is that it's short lived because at some point, let's say there was a dream car that you wanted. There's a vacation mm -hmm. you always wanted to go on. There's an amount of money you wanted in the bank account. But at some point, it loses its luster. The new car is just a car. You know, you go to the vacation and then all of a sudden you kind of get used to it and your all your problems are still there because you carry them with you. You know, there's an expression wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> so, rather than I'm going to do it to get happy. What if we flip it and say, I'm going to start with happiness and I'm going to go after what I want happily, loving the process day by day by day, knowing that every day I'm getting a little bit closer to where it is I want to be. And I'm not basing the happiness on the outcome. I'm basing it on the process. When you do that every day, there's that expression, you know, when you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. That's it's right. still work, but it doesn't feel like work because you love your process. So again, my loving challenge for everyone is find a way to do what you do happily as yeah, you work absolutely. towards wherever it is you're going. Yeah. So additional to that, right. So you prefaced this earlier is, um, you know, attaining the goal and then, uh, always meeting and exceeding those, those goals that we establish, right? So I had an interview with, with a gentleman and he was talking about how he built this real estate portfolio, right? Millions and millions of dollars, right? And one of the things that he was, he was doing, he was committed to building a multi, multi-million dollar property um, down in Florida, right? This thing sits on, the, sits on the ocean. It has beautiful palm trees that he brought in to be, to be planted, you know, LED lights in, in, in his pool. And he was talking about one day after accomplishing that, he was laying in his pool and he just got depressed hmm. because that was the only goal. That was the biggest goal that he was striving to hit and nothing beyond that, yeah. right? And what happened is that he ended up losing a lot of that, that things that he, that he have created. Because, right, he, he, he attained a goal, but nothing to look forward after that. So it's really important that as we create certain things in our life, we always have an exciting future associated with that feeling that we're trying to attain. And we always create and, you know, and, and growing as a spiritual being because, you know, that. You know, the, if we don't have an exciting future to look for, that's why a lot of folks fall into depression because they, they're searching for something that, that um, they, they, not, they have not created a feeling for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's two things that come to mind. One is, there's a, so I started into this kind of personal development journey and coaching and things that were working with people early. I was 14 years old. And when I came to know um, the work of Tony Robbins, that's kind of where it really started for me around that age. And um, he had a quote, which he still says now, that success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. So Sorry. the first thing to keep in mind is anyone listening, you've got you know, goals that you're working towards, but sometimes those goals aren't actually yours. Sometimes it's you know, maybe your family's goals for you or society's, your community's goals for you that you maybe adopted at an early age because you had some story. This is what's expected to me, of me. 
This is how I'm going to get love. This is when people will think I'm successful, whatever story you've got. And you've been doing it for you know months, years, decades, however long. And maybe you're getting close. Maybe you're not. Maybe you've already arrived like that person in, in Hutch's story. But either way, take a moment to check in. You know, I like to do it daily, but at least weekly. Check in with yourself. Am I happy? Am I living the life that I believe I should be living? And if the answer is no, that's good to know versus 40, 50 years down the line, you finally check in and you realize that you haven't been living your version of your life. So that's not something that I think anybody wants to step into. And then yes. the second, oh, please go. No, so I think one of the things that, you know, that, that I've been aspiring to create in my own pers personal life is, you know, really identify who I am as, as, a, as a spiritual being. And I think once you get maybe not extreme clarity, but some clarity of who you are and who you can create, you know, you start asking yourself, is that, is the life I'm living deserving of me? Mm. Right? Because we are so much more powerful at any time. There's so much pent up, um, pent up potential that's within us, but it takes, a, it takes some clarity of self to really understand that we have some pent up, um, some pent up um, potential, you know what I mean? So is the life that I'm living worthy of me as a spiritual being with this physical body? You know what I mean? So that's one of the, one of the things that I'm aspiring to, to ensure that I live up to that full potential right now. And I love that. And for, for anyone who's, some people are listening, some people are watching this on YouTube. If you can see, Hutch had a great smile the whole time he was saying that. Like, there's such genuine energy that he radiates, which is wonderful to see. And um, with that in mind, a few things. One is just to keep in mind, for anyone who's got a goal right now, sometimes, I, I learned this from a mentor years ago, when you're 85, 90% of the way to accomplishing a goal, it's really useful at that point to set a new goal. Because what ends up happening is it's almost like a rollover and you just keep the momentum and you just keep going. But if you just hit a goal and then you just stop, then it's almost like, is this all there is? And you drop into that space of start. You Maybe you're like concerned, you're worried. Like the gentleman you talked about, maybe you get depressed. You created all this and now it's like, for what? So then what would happen now if A, you do the check-ins that I was alluding to and you're making sure that you're living the life that you want to be living and the way that Hutch put it, a life that's worthy of you. Because most of us, and I say this with all the respect, you know, in the world, you're capable of a 10 and you're being a three far too often. And yes. when you come from that space and you realize, wow, you know, maybe I'm crushing it in an area of life and I am a 10 or a nine or an eight, but there's a lot of areas of life where compared to who you could be, you fall far short. And there's no judgment around that. It's just when you're aware of it, most of us, I think we kind of delude ourselves. I say on a scale of one to 10, 10 is who you could be. Where do you play at? And you go, you know, seven, but seven's pretty close to a 10. And when you look at the results you're creating right now, if you truly stepped into commitment, if you truly stepped into integrity, if you really gave it everything you had, you're telling me you could only raise it one, two or three points. And the reality is most of us probably operate at that two to six, two to five level. And that's good news. Because that means there's so much, like you said, untapped potential that you can right. step into in your relationships, in your business, in your finances, in your health, in your friendships, in your community, in all these different areas. It's incredible what every single one of us is capable of. And it actually, uh, you know, segues really beautifully into, you know, when I said, when I started the podcast, I said, I interview leaders, champions, and high performers. Now, something to keep in mind for everyone listening, sometimes we think, wow, you know, I wish I was a leader, champion, or high performer. <laughs> I've had people tell me that. They say, uh, you know, I heard your podcast, or before I started the podcast, I would still talk about that's who I work with. And they'll say, right. I really wish I could be that. And I say, can I tell you something? And they'll say, yeah, sure. And I'll say, being a leader, champion, and high performer is a decision that you make every single day. It, you're not born that way. And when we recognize, my, by my definitions, a leader is a person who... They have this vision, this mission. It's bigger than just themselves. It's about, I want to serve my family, my company, my community. And then maybe depending on the size of the vision, you know, my country or the world, I want to make a right. big impact. You know, when I think about a champion, it's, I want to be the best that there is at this thing. And when I think about a high performer, it's, I want to be the best that I can be at this thing. And notice that there is no 
inherent, you were born that way in any of those things, you got clear, like, like, uh, like Hutch said, what is a life that would be worthy of me? And like I said, is this the life I want to be living? Like, what would I love? And then get clear on that. And then you go all in at that nine, 10 level and you stick with it because it speaks to your spirit. It lights you up. And then you choose to be the high performer and you ask, well, what would a high performer do in this situation? How would a champion, what would the mindset be? I remember like years ago hearing uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's biography and <laughs> there's a story about him where, you know, when he was in Austria, he was training and he wanted to be, I, I believe it's when he wanted to be Mr. Austria before he won that, but he's in the gym and it's one of those like strong man gyms that normally right. most people don't go to. And he's working out and they've been in there for like four hours and he's working out and all the people are leaving and they go, Hey, Arnold, we're heading out. Let's go. And Arnold goes, no, no, no. Mr. Austria works out eight hours. <laughs> and, it's, and it's this idea of just like leader champion high performer as you know a role that you take on an identification mm -hmm. he identified already as having won mr austria and he was right. thinking well how does mr austria work out how does he eat how does he sleep what does he say yes to what does he say no to and by working out and being in that way he won that and then, he, right. and then he did the same thing for Mr. Olympia, the same thing in Hollywood, all that kind of stuff, like the same recipe. So you can step into being a leader champion and high performer today. And please, you want to add something to that? Yeah, absolutely, man. So one of the quote that I like um, from Arnold Schwarzenegger is that um, someone asked him, you know, someone was saying that, you know, how do you get so much commitment uh, to, to work out? Where do you find a time to work out? And his question to, to this person was, do you sleep? And the person said, yes. Um, and Arnold, Arnold, <laughs> in Arnold way, his, his response was, sleep faster. <laughs> you know what I mean? So this life that we, we aspire to create, and you talk about this earlier, and this is, this, is some, this is the way the Marine Corps kind of inoculate young people into, uh, into the mindset of, of being a Marine. So in the Marine Corps, we, we got a famous quote that everyone need, needs their friends. Everyone need a, need a friend, a purpose, and a chance to belong to something greater than themselves, mm. right? See, yeah. when, when, you, when your life's purpose is greater than just self, like right now, my biggest why is Athena and our three beautiful children, right? So when I was in Jamaica, just growing up by myself, it was really easy to just think about myself and just have fun with the cousins, right? You know, but as you start taking on a bigger purpose, whether it be a Marine or you start having a family, now it's not just about you. Mm -hmm. right you now have friends you got you got purpose and you now belong to something that is bigger than, than, than just you you know see, see the marine corps we have also had this fam famous quote uh, that um you don't get to choose when you die but the caveat is you have the luxury and the opportunity and the privilege to choose how you meet death and that goes into the high performance right where you can live a level two life but we are, we are capable of so much more, right? But that comes with, a, you, know, you know, that comes with knowing yourself and choosing to create a greater version of yourself. I love, thank you for sharing that yeah. quote. And yeah, you know, like I think um, the, like a very, like a, a version of it that came into my mind, same idea, it sounds to me, but this idea of, you know, you don't get to decide when you die because nobody knows, but right. you do get to decide how you live. And when, and when we come from that space, there's a level of ownership and responsibility that we can take. And when you break up responsibility into two words, the ability to respond, the idea is, if I don't like my life the way that it is now, I have the ability to respond differently. And so when, when Hutch was saying, create a why that's bigger than just yourself, it kind of like turns into this perfect formula that I was like kind of breaking, I was like kind of alluding to this idea of first get clear with the check-in. Who am I? What kind of life do I want to live? What's important to me? What matters? Where do I want to go? What would be meaningful for me? And then once you're clear on that, then what would happen if you supercharged it by adding in a bigger, bigger reason to succeed than just you? Maybe right. it's a, a spouse. Maybe it's kids. Maybe it's a family. Maybe it's a community. Maybe it's a charitable organization that really speaks to your heart. Maybe there's a cause in the world that you want to make a positive impact in. But whatever that is, now it's not just you. Like, and that is a recipe for success. And then you apply yourself at that 10 out of 10 level. You identify like Arnold, like you, like the Arnold story and coming from that space of being the leader, the champion, the high performer in your wheelhouse, 
and then you give it time. <laughs> it's incredible yeah. what, what that would lead to. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll give you a story. And it's a real life story, right? So when I moved from, from Florida, uh, from Pensacola, Florida to, to California, right? It just so happened that it, that it, it's right around the time I was getting promoted to my last rank E9, right? There's no, there's no E10 in the Marine Corps. So my last rank E9 in the Marine Corps, uh, my brother surprised me and, and, and visited, wow. right? So that man, that, that made my freaking, that was awesome, right? So out of all the, the other nine, nine promotion, that one was the most important, not because it was the most senior I'm going to be, but because of my brother that was, that, that was there. We grew up in the same, same, you know, same environment in, in, in Jamaica. But one of the beautiful things that happened when he came and visit is that, you know, the way that I live compared to where people, folks live in New York, Right. One of the things that he was saying that where he is in New York, he was like, it was like, he called me Shalana. I was like, man, where I live in New York is like somebody puts you in a hole and say, good effing luck, get out. <laughs> right. So when he came to Cali um, and, you know, couple kind of a mastermind together and, you know, he was like, man, I can see clearly. Right. And it's, it's kind of like when General Mattis as a teenager was locked up in prison right, not locked up in jail for the, for the weekend, is his bunkmate, you know, he was looking down to see what was going on in the parking lot, and his bunkmate was laying there in the bed, you know, and his bunkmate asked General Mattis, what do you see down there? Oh, some, 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 some folks playing around, right, drinking and stuff, right, and, and also I, I see some dirt, I see road, and his bunkmate said, from here, I can see stars, you know, so his line of sight, was pretty much endless, yeah. right? So when my brother came and visited me in, in California and he, he got to see the, the potential of his life and he went back, right? He didn't quit his job, but he started a business and then he was able to work, now he works for himself, right? So he started one truck, now you have, you have a box truck and now we, now we have a semi truck that is using to improve his, his lifestyle, right? So, so what is our line of sight uh, yeah. for our future, right? And what is the feeling that, we, that we're trying to create as well? So it kind of go full circle, you know what I mean? So what, what are you looking at? Are you looking at the, 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 the negative aspect of your, of your life or are you looking towards a broader future and letting that pull you along with that, that, that associated feeling towards a better version of self and also a bigger commitment to the ones that you care the most about. Yeah. So first of all, just congratulations to your brother for making that yes. happen. And, you know, it, it, um, please share this with him. <laughs> I'd love for him to I will do. But just this, um, as simple as it sounds, when you focus on what you don't want, you get more of it. And when people realize that they can shift their focus to what they do want, look at your life the way it is now, get real mm -hmm. realistic about that, then get clear on where you want to go. And then at one day at a time, like you said, like small truck, this truck, bigger truck, it's one day at a time, one foot in front of the next. What's That's the right. action to take today? How do I win the day? You will get there. You know, the, exactly. the, the idea is that whether it's a year from now, 20 years from now, the time's going to pass anyway. So as long as you enjoy it, as long as it's what you want, it doesn't matter how long it takes. <laughs> and when we can be there, it changes everything. Yeah, this too shall pass. And I know you, you are a, um, a big reader of Stephen, Stephen Covey, right? Mm -hmm. And this man have changed my life significantly back in 2015. I was at what I consider one of my darkest space in the, in, in the, in the Marine Corps. You know, um, and to your point about, about choices, right? One of the biggest takeaway from the seven habits of highly effective people is Stephen Covey painted this, this, this paradigm for me, or give me a paradigm shift by telling me the story about Victor Frankl or telling us about the story about Victor Frankl, right? And if you follow in Stephen Covey, you're well familiar with this topic, right? But one of the biggest thing or quotes or saying that really changed the trajectory of my life, right? is a quote by Viktor Frankl, and I'm paraphrasing here, I think I've made it mine, right? It says, between stimulus and response, see, every day we wake up, there's always going to be something that is acting up on us, right? That, that, that's, that's stimulus, all right? So between stimulus and response, there's space. And in that space, we have the freedom to choose our response. In our response lies our happiness and our growth. 
Mm. So when you, when you finally realize that you have that level of control over yeah. the, 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 the way you choose the response or the, the power that, that, that's um, the innate power that's, that's within you or the latent power that's within you, it's man, it is such a transformational way of thinking, right? And also a transformation, transformational way of being, right? And when you learn that, when you have that most control, man, the future becomes so much more exciting, brother. Um, communication with others, regardless of what the, the stimulus is, whether it be a negative conversation, you know you have that power of being you. Absolutely, man. I often tell my clients, think of it like this. Most people think life happens in two stages. Something happens and then I feel a certain way about it. The reality is there's a missing middle step. Something happens. I make it mean something. I feel what I make it mean. That's the reality of it always without exception. And when we can be there, that alludes to what you said with the Viktor Frankl, Victor Frankl quote, this idea of no matter what happens, I am the meaning-making machine. Everything in nature, everything in life is neutral. I give it, I paint it with the meaning. And so that changes everything. Now, it does. a question that I wanted to ask you, you know, given the, your background, the work that you do, the way that I've known you thus far, you're an incredible leader. And I'd love to ask you, can you share with us, what does leadership mean to you? So I tell you, I talk about a dark, dark spot in my Marine Corps career. This is, this is a point where the level of commitment that I have, because even growing up, I think in, in, most, in most minority culture, um, there is a thought process that you have to work harder than the perceived majority, mm-hmm. right? But I really think the way that is delivered is misguided because it, it does paint a separation, right? But um, Napoleon Hill talks about, talks about doing more than you're paid to do, right? I think everyone has to understand that concept. See, if you want to be successful in life, you want, you got to do what successful people do, right? Or aspire to do that, right? But it really takes a lot of self-accountability. And so, you know, t- to your question, one of the things that I've seen with leaders, um, and this, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I was a victim, but this is um, one of the things that I had to overcome is that I believe a lot of leaders, they are not 100% or they're not aware of self-leadership and self-mastery. See, in order to lead order, others, you really have to be have a a strong commitment to learning self and be committed to self mastery, right? And when you have or aspire into self mastery, that puts you into inside of a whole different paradigm, a whole different way of thinking of the way you show up for others. Because we often hear the quotes that um, be the leaders that you want to see in others or be the change you want to see in the world. Right. But if you are a crappy individual, less, yes, you can lead by intimidation, by, you know, hold dangling some carrots or holding things over people's head. But when you can lead by example, because of your commitment to self mastery, I think that that's the epitome, epitome of being an effective leader, right? Because your subordinate now see the quality of, of the spiritual being that you are, that the way you show up, and also the quality of life. And the way you show up, the way you show up for others, the way you show up for your family, right? Here's one thing that I that I really discourage, and um, I don't hate very many things in my life, but it's one of the things that I hate. I really do hate when people speak negatively about the ones that they should care the most about. And when you are in a position of leadership and you hate your life, mm-hmm. when you come, when you show up and you speak negatively about your children, make them sound like they're inconvenience. When you, when you show up as a leader and you speak negatively about your spouse, right? Um, like as if they were inconvenience, as if you didn't choose to spend your life, your subordinates see this. Yeah. So when you're on a path to self-mastery, right? All that stuff is, has to have synergy and your subordinates see that. And I do believe the self-mastery, the way you show up for others, 
the way you represent the ones you care the most about, your subordinates see that. And I think it makes you a more effective leader. I had to learn the hard way, right? Yeah. And that brought me to a real dark space. I was 100% committed, right? Um, but I didn't truly know. I know I knew the leader that I that um that my Marines deserve, but I was not growing as the leader that they deserve, mm -hmm. right? So I went to a dark dark place, and I had to change the way I show up. Not that I was I was speaking bad about my family, right? But I did not have clarity on who I was. And once I got clarity on who I was, man, it's been a game changer for, for the way I show up, you know, for my family and also for my, my Marines. I love that, man. If you wouldn't mind sharing, when you were in that dark space, what did you remind yourself of that pulled you out of it? What did you remind yourself of that allowed you to, to become, you know, who you are now? Yeah, so... Um, I had to change what I had to pretty much kill who I was, mm -hmm. literally. Yeah. Th that, that old me had to die. Like yeah. really. Right. I had to, I need a new, I, I need a new, I need a rebirth. Yeah. I didn't know what I did not know. See, um, our, our good mentor and good leader, General, General Mattis, saying that if you are not reading, right, if you're not reading history, if you're not reading about successful leader, you are pretty much you are walking in, say, you, I forgot what the exact words that he, that he used, right? He said, if you are not reading um, 10, 10 books and taking action, you are functioning illiterate and potentially, potentially incompetent. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So sometime we need a rebirth. It took me, um, Dr. Jamil, about 35 years to really know who I was and how I should be showing up for the ones that care about that care the most care the most about right and also for the ones that are leaving it took me 35 years so it's not a memory of who i was right it was a rebirth for me yeah a whole different person and once i once i realized my pent up my pent up potential it was a game 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 changer you know so i had to find a new version of myself brother yeah man as i'm looking in your eyes i feel your heart as you share this and i thank you so much for opening up about that and i hope everyone is listening first sees that if one person can do it, we all can do it. And what Hutch did of the old me needs to die for a lot of us listening and for everyone listening at some point in your life, this is true. The old you needs to die because the old you got you to where you are now, but the old you is not going to get you to where you want to be. And so when we recognize that, then we slow down and we say, okay, am I bringing in the old me into my new life? Am I trying to do that? And if you are, you're probably running into some hardship and resistance and it's not working as well as you would like. And that's the reason <laughs> because that old that's version it. of you isn't going to, isn't going to play ball at that level. And so it's, um, it's that, that level of commitment that you have, that you have, and that you had, it's the recipe I think for success all across the board. There's an expression, how we do one thing is how we do everything. And you know, to me, I look at that and I think, okay, how you show up in one level of life, if there's an immense amount of commitment, it's probably a way of being. It's how you show up in the world. So you're probably doing it in other areas of your life too. And so it's likely gonna cross over. So I get what people mean by that. And when you talked about you know, leadership in various books, it reminded me of um, John C. Maxwell wrote a book called The Five Levels of Leadership. And the, there's, you know, there's five different levels and the, the peak level, I think it's just called the pinnacle. It's people follow you because of who you're being, because of how you show up in the world, not they follow you because you have a rank or they follow you because of what you can do for them. Or they follow you, like you said, because of like fear or what you might do to them if they, if they don't you know, listen to you. When right. people follow you because how you show up in the world, now you're just a beaming role model you're just walking around and people see you and they're inspired by you and inspired comes from in spirit and when you're in <laughs> spirit you reconnect people to who they really are because they see that and they go wow in this example what hutch just did maybe i can treat my wife like that like the way he talks about his kids maybe i could talk about my kids like that wow maybe i saw him in the gym every morning at 4 a.m. or something. And I'm like, why are you here? Oh, because I have a really busy day and this is the only time I can come and whatever story we've got. But it ends up being, they've been telling themselves like stories about why they can't do it. And then they see you having the same limitations and doing it anyway. And they go, maybe I could do that. 
And when you live your life in such a way that people around you get inspired and then they think, is that possible for me? Like, could I do that? You are now a gift in so many people's lives because just you being you has this immense ripple effect of impact versus you're not trying to do anything other than be you. It's not okay. like I'm going to be this level of leader. I get what you meant when you said this, but it's like, for me, it's not, I'm going to be this level of leader for my people. It's I'm going to be this level of leader because that's who I want to be in the world. That's who I want to <laughs> show up as. And the, my people being around me is the ripple. They, they're going to get the benefit from that. Now I am going to fuel it also with how they benefit and everything too. But I think that when we first and foremost, like raise the standard for yourself, like think about that level 10, that's the best leader you can be. Strive to be that. Everything else takes care of itself. Right. You want to be that level of leader in your relationship, with your family, with your finances, with your health, with everything. And if you were to do that, it is incredible how life changes. And you know, when we think of a leader, a leader obviously does many things. But one thing a leader does is they need to be resourceful. And they have to be creative because when the situation doesn't happen the way you planned, which is probably most of the time, <laughs> most people will receive that in a, oh my God, it didn't work. What are we going to do? And almost they might even get discouraged. They lose heart. And courage comes from cur, which is Latin for heart. So discouraged is disheartened. And disheartened, it's like, well, what's the point? You kind of give up. But the leader inspires. The leader speaks life into. The leader comes up with new ideas. Well, let's do this that level of resourcefulness, it makes it where you can't be stopped. It makes it where no matter what happens, you go through anyway. You know, there's a, a meme that goes around. It just, the letter A and the letter B, and <laughs> it's a straight line. And it goes, people think this is what success is. And then there's another picture, A and B, and the line is like this roller coaster of squiggles everywhere, and it finally connects to B. And it's just going to show you that sometimes you take three steps forward, 12 steps back, Sometimes, you know, you break your foot along the way and then you got to rest for a bit, whatever happens. But if you don't let yourself get stopped, if you say, I will find a way, you know, that's that recipe for success. If I'm going to keep course correcting, I'm going to keep evaluating my situation, taking new action, evaluating the results of that new action, checking in, am I happy? Am I on purpose? Am I living the life I want to live? And then right. keep doing that and keep doing that. It's like a spiral that just cycles upwards and upwards. Oh, man. So you talk about the different ways to get from A to B. I want to talk about how to get from B to D. <laughs> sure. Right. So, you know, so this is something that I learned, that I learned recently. And it, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing way to, to look at life as we wake up every single day. See, every day we, we wake up, we have, so let's, say life, let's say life is a C between B and D. Right, so we got birth, mm. and at some point, the inevitable is going to happen. We're going to die. See, every day we wake up, right? We have a chance. So that's a, that's one C. And with those chances, everything we do are is choices. So when we meet the obstacle, we have choices to make. Are we? Do we choose to be defeated by that obstacle? Or do we choose to navigate through that obstacle, right? It's a, and and as, as we go through the, make these life choices, then of course it determines how we meet death, mm. right? So life is, the, life is the, the C between B and D, you know what I mean? So, and it's all about the, the, the chance we have and the choices we, have, we make on a daily basis. I really like that. Yeah. <laughs> a to B and then B to D. That's so cool. <laughs> the, uh, it reminds me of this a poem. If anyone hasn't heard, uh, read it or heard it, I recommend you look it up. It's, it's free, takes two seconds and it's short. <laughs> and it's called The Dash by Linda right. Ellis. I think it's E-L-L-I-S, but either way, The Dash. And essentially, it's what you just talked about. You know, somebody passes on and you see their, 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 their tombstone, let's say, if they have one, and there's the dates on it. And in between the dates is the dash. And the dash represents their whole life. The dash <laughs> is everything in between. So the whole poem is about how are you spending your dash? You know, mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful poem and I definitely recommend people read it. And I'd love to ask you, since we're talking about leadership, what are some things that you can share with us given your life experience and all the leadership opportunities you've had? How can people become better leaders? Yeah, so one 
it has to start with, with, with self, self-awareness, right? You really have to start with, with self-awareness, but also having a vision for exactly what you're trying to create. Having vision and clarity for what you're trying to create, because if you don't have clarity, right? You know, one, without, without, without a vision, the people, people will perish, perish right? Yeah. Without a vision, the people perish. The same is true without a, without a leader. Imagine Elon Musk. Elon Musk has a vision to occupy Mars. That's pretty freaking big and an audacious goal, right? But it's a big audacious goal, but it's also exciting. That is something you can get people excited about, right? So the vision that you have, right, and the people that you're leading, it has to be absolutely, um, it has to be exciting for them to one, see the vision, and jump on board w- w- with you. But, but then, of course, it goes to that self self mastery, um, in your ability to to lead by example and being able to explain the vision, right? So, we are in the in- information age, and this is this is something that I deal with on, on a daily basis, right? I hear a lot, I won't say a lot, some of my fellow leaders on this level will say things ain't the same, right? The Marines, the Marine Corps is changing. Uh, maybe it's time for me to retire, but yeah, of course the things are changing, right? I came in in, 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 the, in the late nineties, right? And things have changed drastically. But when I speak to um, Athena's dad, who, who, was a, who was a Marine in Vietnam, his level of what the Marine Corps was is not something that I remotely want to experience, <laughs> right? And I, I believe the same will be true about my time in the Marine Corps in the late in late eighties. I mean, late late nineties and two thousands, right? I think the same is true. You know, for, for a Marine that come that comes twenty years from now, you, you, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So things are always going to be changed. So as leaders, we have to be adaptable. And understanding that um, the people that come into our organization, right, we're getting those, we're getting those people from, from America or wherever they come from around the world. They come to uh, our team with their, their, own, their own sense of belonging, their own personal goal, their own professional goals, right? But they also have the, their, own, their own cultural experience that, that they bring to the table. And one, it could add a, enable, uh, it, I mean, a lot of time it, in it, in, in, it's enabled the team to become better because of that, that diversity, right? So as a leader, having a different way of thinking, but also be willing to change with the cultural and societal norms, right? Of course, the, those principled one, right? That are that, um, consistent with the level of growth that you want to see in your company. Mm, I love that. You know, and it's also something I told a client of mine this the other day. So we can either be, leaders in title, or we can be leaders in practice. And what I mean by that is this. You're not a leader just because you say you are, even though I said earlier, you, do, you decide to be, right, in terms of the potential. But you are a leader when you have the opportunity to lead and you step up. That is when you become a leader in actuality, in practice, versus just in your head. Right. And the first is the decision of I am a leader, right? Like I said in the beginning, I choose to be. But now it's like, all right, I choose to be. You said it. Does your life actually live up to that? Does it map to it? Show me all the opportunities that you've chosen to lead. Because coming from that space, like you said earlier, let's say someone's not being, in the way you said it, a good leader. They're maybe bad-mouthing their spouse or their kids. And you were like, well, are you going to pretend you didn't choose that person? It's like when you mentioned that person who maybe they're not a great, they're not being a great leader and they show up and they start complaining, maybe bad mouthing their spouse as if they didn't choose to be with that person. If you're in a leadership role, you chose it. It was an opportunity that was presented to you. You accepted it. And now there's opportunities to lead quote unquote challenges (laughs) that you're now tasked at leading us through it. And are you complaining about it? And it's like, because you chose the job. But if you take each of those opportunities as an opportunity to become a better leader, going back to the uh, the, the John Maxwell book, The Five Levels of Leadership, you right. only go up the ladder and be a better and better leader by having opportunities to lead, by learning from the experience. And it's kind of like every like level two fully encapsulates level one plus, and then three encapsulates two and so on and so right. forth. You only get better by practicing. And so what if you reframed all the challenges you're going through as these are opportunities for me to lead. 
another way of saying it is, you know, if whether it's God, the universe, life, however the belief system is, what if we come from everything I'm going through right now, all the challenges, the hardships, it's preparing me for what I asked for. It's That's literally, right. it's like life saying, in order for you to get that, you're not quote unquote good enough yet, but you will be. <laughs> Life's going to be in such a way that you will get better. And when you really want that thing, you'll be ready for it. You'll be able to handle it. So it's just a really interesting, I think, shift in perspective that as a leader, you, you're here to lead, which means it's going to involve other people. It's going to involve adversity. It's going to involve challenge. And what well, are you going to do about that? Yeah. So um, yeah, the big, one of the biggest things that I'm seeing right now in the informational age, right? These are our Marines. They have access to to ton of information. And one of the things that I, that I realized is that as we focus more, see, there's two important days. I, we could talk about it in life, but I, we say it in the Marine Corps as well. There's two important days um, in your Marine Corps career, right? The day you step on the yellow footprints as an enlisted man, right? I can speak from that perspective. And the day you realize why you step on the yellow footprint, mm. you, you know what I mean? So we all, I think we all join the Marine Corps or join any or most organization uh, for a reason or purpose, right? So some people join for education, some people join for a paycheck, some people join because they want the challenge, they want to continue to to create a better 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 version of them of themselves. But as a leader in in the Marine Corps, it's important for for me and my 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 fellow leaders to understand each individual that or at, at least aspire to understand each individual that we are entrusted to lead because when we are helping them or assisting them with fulfilling what they believe to be their personal purpose right then man the communication become magical right the, the level to come to you with the ability to come to you with um with any issues that they're going through because look people bring their problems to people who they believe can solve them Right. And I think as a leader, if your people are not coming to you to solve problems, it's a question that we need to ask ourselves. Right. Right. Mm. Am I being the leader that 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 um, demonstrates um, competence? Right. Do, do I show them that I that I care? Right. And do I lead with conviction? Right. So these are things that these these Marines, I know that they, they're talking amongst this small group. Right, which is a bigger group than the leaders that they're interested to, to lead them. Right. So this small group is actually big and influential, you know. So, and when they start bringing their problems to you to, to solve, you know that you are starting to make an impact. And the more impact you make on the ones you're entrusted to lead, I believe the more successful we shall be as leaders. Yeah, well said. Love that. Yeah. You know, I think so much of leadership and so much of just success in life in general comes down to mindset. And we've talked about that a good amount, but would love to ask you, given the success that you've created in your life, given what you're working on now, what role does mindset play in you getting to where you want to be? Oh man. So I'm a relationship guy. <laughs> As you, I'm not sure if you can tell that doc. Um, I, I have a true, I'm a true lover of people. Right. And I really do believe that I became that way. Right. Because I, I grew to love myself, to love myself down to my freaking core, down to my spiritual level, brother. <laughs> I am telling you, that's how much I love myself. And when you love yourself that deep, you show up loving people just, just, just naturally. I, I'm a firm believer, right? So no matter how people, even just even just with respect, right? No matter how people show up in an, in, in an environment, you ending up loving them, caring for them and respecting them just because the love, care and respect that you have for self. So you, sometimes it's not because of who they are, but it's because of who you are, right? And what I do uh, um, as a real estate in, investor and in real estate syndicator is that I focus on building meaningful and long lasting, mutually beneficial relationship. A lot of time it's financially driven, but it start off with the relationship, right? Mm -hmm. that's, where th that's where things start. Because look, if I have a conversation with you and I don't get a good feeling to my core that you are a good person, I don't believe that you are somebody that I want to work with because the relationship that we create in the real estate syndication space is that 
in, right? When we purchase the property, it's going to be, you know, three, five, you know, seven, eight years before we exit that property. That's a long relationship. Yeah. That's longer than a lot of marriages. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? So we're yeah. in this relationship together and we're going to have ups and downs. The market's going to go up. The tenant's not going to pay. We're going to have a, a, a unit that, that is completely trashed, right? You know, you know what I mean? So these things, I'm going to have to tell you at some point, like, look, this is where we are in this investment, the investment journey, right? Um, we might not need to make distribution or your distribution this quarter might be a little bit less than expected. And here's why. So I will, we all have to understand the level of deposits that we have had in those personal or professional relationships, right? To whenever we get to, or whenever we have to, or get to, um, you know, test those relationships or deliver those, those not so great news, right? We're not totally ruin, ruining those, ruin, ruining those relationships. Yeah. You know what I mean? So um, even as a leader in, in the Marine Corps, there at some point, um, I don't use my knife hand anymore, but it, it's available, <laughs> right? It's, it's available and it, it's, it's straight and direct. You, you know what I mean? Um, but so when I have to speak, when I have to um, emphasize the importance of certain points, right? It, it might not be with a smile, but because of the level of relationship and the trust and commitment that I've had to those relationships, then I will not totally ruin that um that marine's ability to to do what i say yeah you, you get what i'm saying it will not have a adverse um emotional effect right yeah. they'll be like okay um master guns this is important to master guns right he choose me to do it boom i go do it come back task mission accomplished master guns what, what is next Right. And then we move on. We might even sit down and, you know, let's talk about, you know, what did you learn in that process? And, you know, express my appreciation. I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate this. Sis. Right. Like a little conversation like those. But as far as what we do in the, in the real estate, real estate um, um, business, it's all about relationship. It's a relationship um, driven business. And one of the things that he, um, Dr. Jones, um, Heath and I is committed to is giving back to organization that benefits our veteran. As a 20 plus year Marine, right? Um, I have a place in my heart for, for veterans because um, these folks, man, some folks pay the ultimate sacrifice, but the level of commitment that America requires to stay relevant in the world, right? It's, it's, <laughs> it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't accept nothing less than 100% commitment. Yeah. Right. So um, even though I'm on active duty, Heath um, supports the, the army. He, he's an auditor of research. He does auditor research for the army to protect our soldiers air, hearing all right, by the research that he do to help them to get um, battlefield orientation, um, you know, when, when flying their helicopters, you know, but outside of that, we donate 10 percent of all of our acquisition fees to mm -hmm. nonprofit organizations that benefit our veterans. Right, so that is that is a cause that we feel is is necessary based on the level of commitment um, required from those who have served um, in our nation's uh, military. That's so beautiful, man. Thank you, Kristen. First of all, for doing that, and you know, it's you talk about relationships. For everyone who's listening right now, considering your relationships, and similar to what Hutch said, you can say practically anything if it's said. First, with respect, and second, if the person really feels in their in their spirit that you love them, that you care about them, that what you're saying to them is in their best interest, it's for their own good, and when they really believe that, you know, it, it's an incredible thing, and it, it's what came to mind when you shared that because not only would that apply <laughs> to like let's say people that are in the Marines that are that are subordinates to you, but that would apply to kids, that would apply to friends that you really love and they're not seeing something and you want to point it out, but it might hurt their feelings, but you're going to say yes. it. With love. <laughs> That's the like same kind of idea. It applies to my work. <laughs> when, I'm, when I want to call somebody out on something, it's for them. It's not for me. Like, and, and I'm doing it with love and respect in my heart. And they know that. And that's why you might, you know, sting in the moment, but a week later, a day later, it's like, Oh my God, thank you so much for saying that. That's what I needed. You know, that's right. kind of thing. And so, you know, the foundation of my work and of this show, is to help people create an extraordinary life without regret. 
in your life experience? Can you please share with us? How would you advise someone to do that? Um, I got this from, from um, uh, my good friend, Uncle Les Brown, right? Yeah, I love him. <laughs> yeah, a mentor, mentor, coach, friend, father figure, grandfather figure, right? So one of the things that, that, that Les Brown talks about, he says, imagine the end of your life, right? Um, the ideal way to die. And I, I believe you might have gotten the story from, you might have gotten learning from somebody else and he taught it to me, right? And it taught it to a lot of other folks. Yeah. But he taught it to me. Yeah. So you get to the end of your life and the ideal way to die is to be surrounded by grandkids, great, 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 great grandkids, a, a bloodline that you have created that's sprung from you, right? But imagine a life where instead of all your families and your entire bloodline, right, you're surrounded by your dreams and aspiration that came to you over the years. See, we all think about some very exciting or the ideal future state of our life that we aspire to create. But the crazy thing is that not, there's not enough people taking action on those good ideas that we pull from what I call, or, you know, my good friend, our good mentor, Napoleon Hill calls, calls infinite intelligence. Yeah. Right. So that information, it comes to us and it's up to us to give it birth. Right. And let it grow all those really amazing ideas. Right. So it's important that we take action on those beautiful thoughts that we have. Like even beautiful thoughts, it just it just occurred to me right now. I need to call my mom. Please write it down. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I need to call my mom. And that's it. Even just talking, talking about it right now, it gave me a really good feeling just hearing her voice and the fact that I can still hear her, her voice, man. You know, just that alone. You yeah. know, so, and it goes into, you know, creating business, creating businesses and, and um, ensuring that we are thinking big, thinking big and taking actions on, on, on those great ideas that come to us. Because look, when we don't think big, it is the, the ones whose life we could be changing will suffer the most. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, it might be part of the same story. Les Brown says the richest place in the world is the graveyard. <laughs> and because in the graveyard, that's where so many goals and dreams were buried there. So many. And they're never going to be acted upon and the world will never know the impact that that would have had. And right. so often, you know, we buy into that story of fear about why we don't do whatever it is that we're excited to do. And as a simple, simple little loving challenge, what if, rather than ask yourself the what if question, what if it doesn't work out? What if you just entertain the possibility of what if it works out amazingly well? What if it works out better than I can possibly imagine? What if doing this and taking this next step that I'm excited but also scared to take, what if taking that step is the unlock to everything that I've wanted, but life or God or the universe is just waiting for me to do this one thing to give me everything else? It's almost like saying, show me how bad you actually want this. Take a step and then I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll match it, you know, <laughs> but you got to take the step first. And so often we want to wait, you know, um, this idea is that like life is 50, 50. You don't say, Hey, firewood, give me heat. And then I'll light you on fire. Like no, yeah. no, no. <laughs> you light it first and then the heat comes. Life is the same way. You have that amazing idea, implement it day by day, bring it to life. You know, Napoleon Hill right. talks about everything is created twice, first in the mind and then yes. in actuality. Same idea, everything's created first in the head and the mind. So you sit there and go, oh, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. And that's great. But like you said earlier about like it's potential. And at the same time, while potential can be seen as a great thing, potential also means you're not doing anything. It's... <laughs> If, if someone goes, you got potential, on the one hand, it means like you're capable of a lot. And on the other hand, it means you're not doing anything. <laughs> and so we can sit there and realize, okay, I have this idea. Let me act on it because I don't want to be the richest man in the graveyard. I don't want right. to be the person. I want to be the person that I've spent it all. I, I've like, there's a beautiful quote that a mentor of mine shared with me. He's Mormon. And so he's, uh, it's like this wooden plaque and it's on his wall. And it says basically, 
God, when I die, I hope that I stand before you and I can look at you and say, I used everything you gave me. Wow. Right. This idea that I've got nothing left. The tank is empty. <laughs> you know, it's like the same kind of way. Are you living your life in such a way that you can say, you know, your version of whatever that is? And if mm -hmm. the answer is no, you're listening to this, you're alive right now, you can change. You know, we talked about responsibility, the ability to respond differently. And if the answer is yes, then awesome. You know, keep living the life the way you're doing it. Keep acting on those exciting ideas and please share them far and wide. We're excited to see the unique individual magic that, you know, you bring to everyone's life experience. That's right. Yeah. And so yes, sir. given the life experience that you've had, if you could, you know, there's people listening to this podcast from all age groups. Some of them are very young. Some of them are much older. Some of them are in the middle. And so, you know, the whole, the full span of life, knowing what you know now, if you could go back and speak to 18 year old Hutch, is there any advice that you would give him? Is there a life perspective you would give him something that you've learned that you know now in your heart to be true, that would really serve people who are listening to know who, who maybe haven't learned that lesson yet? Yeah, so <laughs> that, that, that's a question that I get, that I get asked quite, a, quite often, mm -hmm. right? And here's, here's my answer to that. We all have our individual journey that we have to travel, right? And a lot of times we won't find value in things until it's important to us. Yeah. Right? So I can go back and tell 18-year-old me about who I am now, but would 18-year-old me really find value in the information that I'm sharing if I was not seeking it. See, the mind will, I mean, the eyes will not see and the ears will not hear what the mind is not looking for, right? So is, it was 18-year-old me looking for this version of myself or do I need to learn the life experience to get to a place where now this information becomes relevant? Mm. You know what I mean? So I can tell my 18-year-old self everything that I want, but will he find it? Case in point, right? My good friend, um, Sir Patham, all right, Gunnar Sergeant Sir Patham, right? Um, we both joined Marine Corps right around, right around the same time, right? Um, and we was going through NCOs, non-commissioned officer around the same time as well. But he read this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, mm -hmm. because of his upbringing and also the family that he got married into, they understood money. They understand how assets and liabilities work and all the good stuff. So his paradigm has shifted. And he said, Hutch, you need to read this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it took me like 13, 14 years to actually read that book. Mm. I did not read that book until it was important to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I say that to say this. I don't believe, I don't think 18-year-old me, just looking back, was looking for this version of myself. Mm. And I love that too, because it, I think it shows everybody wherever you are right now is exactly where you're supposed to be. And when you come from that space and realizing that I, I'll know when I know the lessons that are there for me to learn, you know, I'll learn them right. <laughs> from whatever the experience that needs to happen. And something that I have answered the question in a different, but it seems like at least the intention, similar way that, you know, sometimes people have asked me, if you could go back and do things differently, what would you do differently? And on the surface, I could come up with a couple answers that I think you know, I, I would do this, I would do that, I would do that. But then when I really think about it, I say, I wouldn't do anything differently. And the reason is because who I am today is based on all that. So I change any of that. And who knows the ripple effect that that would have on my life. And you go left instead of going right. You didn't meet that person that you met and that person changed your whole life. And now you're a whole different <laughs> life. It's like, you know, the life that I've lived, there's been challenges, there's been hardships like everybody, right. but that has allowed me to become, it strengthened me. It's allowed me to step into a role that maybe I wouldn't have, you know, otherwise. And so I think if we can take that to heart, then we don't feel like less than. It's like, you know what? This is my life right now. These are the lessons I've learned along the way. It's beautiful. There's going to yes, be sir. beautiful moments in the future. There's going to be challenging moments in the future. I can count on that. And I know that I'll be okay. I'll know I'll get through it. I know I'll become better, stronger, wiser, faster, all that great stuff. <laughs> yeah. And so yes, what would you say 
is the biggest risk that you've taken that you're deeply grateful for and why? When you look um, back, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say uh, biggest risk. Well, well, I could say coming to America, that was a big risk, but I was still a young person. So that was really was not really a risk. <laughs> so I think one of the biggest risks is um, taking a chance on myself. Mm. See, um, in my, well, I won't say my culture, but in my, my circle, my sphere of influence, um, growing up in the Marine Corps, um, there was no one really speaking about life after the Marine Corps, right? Well, they did to a certain extent, which is um, get you experience and then leverage that experience outside of the Marine Corps after you retire for another 20 plus years, collect, get work towards retirement and then collect two retirement checks, right? But the fact that there's a different pathway you can actually create your own business. And we'll see a few Marines, a few service members doing this as well, right? Um, actually creating a business. So like Jim Rome talked about is, is um, working full-time on your income and path on part-time on creating your wealth, right? So I'm happy that I took a chance on myself and just seeing the fruits of my labor and the ability to create a better, um, a better financial situation for my family, right? Mm -hmm. Which give us an, an ability to make more impact on our personal financial life, but also make a bigger impact on our investors and the cause that they want to, that, that they want to contribute to, right? Um, just being able to see the impact we can make um, with, by, by improving our financial status, right? By creating a business, so taking a chance itself. That is, from my perspective, the greatest chance we can take. And I think that for everyone listening, the most courageous, brave thing you can do is to take a chance on you. Now, a few things I want to point out. First, notice that courage does not mean fearless. Courage means you're afraid, but you do it anyway. <laughs> That's right. And, and so when we come from that headspace and we realize, okay, taking a chance, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that it might not work out the way that you'd like it. <laughs> That's what it means. There's, there's uncertainty. There's probability, right? So I'm going to take a chance. What greater thing to take a chance on than you and this possible future that you would love? Because the promise that I can give you, I can't promise that if you do it, it'll work. I can promise that if you don't do it, it won't happen though. <laughs> and when we realize that, you have 100% certainty of failure, if you want to call it that, if I don't do it. And anything greater than zero that it that it could happen if you do do it facts and if, and if you're going to be like we said if you, if you bring our whole conversation together if you take that chance if you identify where am i playing at a two three four five out of ten elevate that where can i raise my commitment where can i show up with more passion and enthusiasm and love for life where can i treat people in my relationships in such a way that they feel the care that i have for them and so much more we do that the chances of you actually making that happen are far greater than 1%. <laughs> and so when you recognize that, it's like the real, I think it was JK Rowling, you know, she wrote the Harry Potter books and maybe right. other ones at least, but at least the Harry Potter books. My understanding is that she got rejected by I think 10 publishers. You know, I, I could be, you know, plus or minus four, but yeah. I, around, <laughs> around, around 10. And I mean, so, six is a good, good. Yeah, but she got rejected by all these publishers. And now, you, you know, you see Harry Potter as it is now and you go, wow, there's like a billion or multi-billion dollar franchise. And all these publishers said, no, nah, I don't think anyone's going to like this. And she just kept going because she believed in it. And she kept going, right. she kept going, she kept going. And there was some talk that she gave that I listened to it, uh, at some point in the last couple of years. And she said, when you don't try, you fail by default. Mm. And it's the same type of idea. You've got, like when Hutch talked about, you don't want to be, uh, well, I mentioned it, but he said it, like, you don't want to be the richest man in the graveyard. You don't want to have the ideas and the dreams and you're on your deathbed and you're not going to be here physically too much longer. And all these, like the ghosts, the way Les Brown said, the ghosts of the dreams that you've had come to you and they say, we came to you to bring us alive and you didn't do it. Like, why? And the only answer is because you chose to live in fear. You let fear right. win and lead the way instead of love. And when you said earlier about being a leader, I've got all these people that are counting on me. And then you said it beautifully, when you don't actualize that dream, it's the people that would have benefited from it that are the ones who suffer. And that's, that's why right. <laughs> to me, you know, I often tell people kind of in my own little bubble, when I think about for 17 years now, my obsession 
has been to learn everything I possibly can about how people work, how success works, how people get in their own way, how to like liberate them from that so they can create the life that they want. And when I think about the trainings and the books and traveling and all that stuff that I do for that, it's not just, oh, I'd love to learn it. That's a big part of it. But there's, there's going to be somebody five years from now who doesn't commit suicide because of what I'm learning right now. And when I stay, when I stay in that, there's going to be a marriage. It doesn't end up in a divorce that leads to a kid having a father and mother that are happy in a house <laughs> together because of what I'm learning right now. And it's like, when I can tune into that, it goes to what I said earlier about attach your goal to a vision bigger than you uh, going off of what you were saying earlier, it creates so much extra energy and passion. And I think we all can do that to some degree. And it, it's just really an amazing thing, man. And so yeah, man, it, it as, is. <laughs> as we, as we wrap up, what is it right now that you're working towards or working on that's exciting you? I'm working to working towards retirement and also on retirement as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, plan to retire from the Marine Corps in less than 24 months wow. um, to continue doing real estate syndication. Real estate syndication will provide us with a lot of flexibility. I get to spend a lot more time with it. my beautiful wife, Adina. She's so freaking amazing, man. She's so amazing. Holy sh I don't know what I did in life to really deserve her, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> Something, you know, she's freaking amazing. You know, so, and that's crazy, crazy thing, Doc, is that every day I work to deserve her every freaking day we've been married for 20 years mm. right and every single day i'm working to deserve her more and more you know what i mean that thing that it never it never stopped the same thing for the for, for our children as well you know working to deserve you know continue being their being their father and be loved as, as their father you know so um, um i'm looking forward to retirement to be able to to spend a lot more time with them to be able to travel a lot more with them or to them when they go to college or off in their personal life whatever the case may be right so i'm looking forward towards that but of course, that comes with um, um, flexibility, right? And the real estate syndication does provide us that flexibility. You know, so I'm looking forward to retirement as I work on retirement um, by purchasing properties in the Southeast um, through apartment syndication, right? And also um, bringing investors to help them to, to one, we work with a lot of service members. Right now, 88% of our, of our um, investors, the well, last time we polled our investors, 88% um, of them were veterans, right? Mm -hmm. So we're looking to help them to get their time back. And to my point earlier, um, I mentioned that um, one of the biggest things that a lot, a lot of folks, we serve 20 years, and then the idea is to, now we get to leverage our, our military experience in corporate America. What Heath and I want to do, we want to reduce that time so they can create more flexibility by creating passive income through multifamily real estate investment. Also, we put, we're bringing them together with um, accredited investors into our deals. Right. And of course, you know, a credit investor, they're looking to solve some problems as well. Right. They might have a tax problem that they, that they want to solve or they just understand the way money works and they want to create more passive income. Right. And they're also looking for the economy of scale. And same is true about those veterans who choose to um, invest with us. So mm -hmm. I'm working towards retirement and also working on retirement. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. And so for, for everyone who's anyone for, for anyone who's listening, rather, who is interested in either partnering with you in an investment, you know, working with you in some capacity, learning from you, whatever that would be, what's the best way to connect with you and where can they learn more? So, right. I'm prominent on LinkedIn as Hutch, the Marine investor, or you can go to our website at h squared and download, download our, our operation manual that kind of tells you how to leverage what we do to improve your financial situation or help you to, to assist you with solving a problem that you might be able to solve, whether, whether it's a tax, what it's um, a tax burden you try to relieve, um, or you just, you're trying to grow your real estate portfolio through um, the economy of scale through apartment syndication, right? So H square capital and download our operation manual. Beautiful. I'll have the links Sorry. to all that in the show notes. And if you've enjoyed our conversation today, it would really mean a lot if first you shared it, shared it with anyone you know that could benefit from this, especially given what Hutch just said. If you know some veterans, <laughs> send them yeah. this. They probably get immense value from it. They can connect with Hutch and they probably lead to a lot of benefit to both of their lives. And so that could be really beautiful. And please, you know, um, leave a review, whether it's on Apple, Spotify, any YouTube, anywhere you check this out, it'd be really wonderful to hear from you. And I'm loving having these conversations with people. And I've heard yeah. some 
beautiful stories of the past interviews and what that's done for people. I know this interview with, with Hutch is going to do so much good in the world. And so again, thank you, Hutch, so much for taking the time to be with us today. For everyone who tuned in, thank you for your time, your attention, your energy. It really does mean the world. Hutch, is there anything you'd like to say before we close? I just want to express my, my, my gratitude to you, my brother. I appreciate you. This is an amazing way to start the day. Like, look, we all have an opportunity or a chance every single day to, to have these kind of conversation. It doesn't have to be with Dr. Jamil over Zoom. It can be with herself, mm. right? So the story that we repeatedly tell herself will, will really determine the quality of life that we live. So every day you wake up, tell yourself the most amazing things about yourself, right? And the future it will be so much more exciting. Yeah. Well said. That's it. <laughs> All right. And so in closing, you know, my life's work is to help leaders, champions, and high performers to create an extraordinary life without regret, a life on your terms that when your head hits the pillow at night, if you were told you weren't going to wake up tomorrow, you could be at peace with that, knowing that you lived your life, not someone else's version of your life. And if you've got a challenge right now in your mindset, your business, your relationships, any area of your life, or you've got a goal, a dream, and you'd like to make that real in 10 months rather than 10 years, I'd love to have a conversation with you, see if I can support you. You can have that call at jamilsayage.com. And if you're looking for more content, other podcast episode, any of the hundreds of pieces of content I put out over the years, you can find that on social media. On Instagram, it's at Dr. Jamil Sayage, which is DR and then my name. And Facebook and LinkedIn are just Jamil Sayage. Everything will be in the show notes as well, in addition to everything the HUD shared with us. So thank you all again so much. And, you know, this podcast is called Transformation Starts Today for a reason. It's called that because I have found that most people's favorite day to change their life is tomorrow. And that's why they stay stuck. But something that we talked about today, I know landed for you. And if you can just apply that, apply, 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 it's the name of the game. Like I said, you have that dream in your mind. Let's make it real. Let's go help some people. Let's go make a meaningful contribution impact in the world your future self is going to be so grateful for you. Thank you so much. All my love and wishing you the best. Create a meaningful day. Thank you for being with us today. If this conversation served you, it would mean a lot if you left a review and shared this with anyone who may benefit. An extraordinary life without regret is available to you now. Choose it. It's your time.